Welcome back to the Revolution in Ideology podcast. I'm Jared. I am Nick. And today we are going to talk a little bit about colonization. We're doing this for a couple of reasons. I'm if, in the interest of of being candid here. I'm developing a new class about case studies and colonialism. So we decided to to research some new cases. We've talked about plenty on this podcast before in our Myth is America series. We've talked about the Columbus story and Tecumseh, and we've done some stuff in the Middle East, even some stuff in Sub-Saharan Africa. But now we're going to move to a region of the world where neither of us are are experts by any stretch of the imagination. But I was always curious about um, the question of Tibet and using it as a case study. So this is going to be somewhat surface level. I'm admitting that. Also pronunciation, this not being a field in which either of us are experts, we will likely both kind of mispronounce a couple of things, but I do think it's an interesting case study and, um, and I really wanted to dig into it. So anything that you would like to add regarding the colonization of Tibet, Nick? Nope. Like you said, I am not an expert here. In fact, I know nothing other than like the surface level whatever so okay so i want we also want to start by saying right off the bat that um the other reason that we were drawn to it is not just because of it being an incredibly important colonial story but because of um as we were kind of growing up it was really popular here in the west every other car seemed to have a free tibet bumper sticker Mm -hmm. things along those lines and uh, that's not a thing anymore. I mean, even even various churches around the town that we grew up in would bring in um, Buddhist monks and they would talk about the trials and tribulations of the people of Tibet. And that doesn't seem to be very, be very popular anymore uh, here in the United States. Do you have any theories as to why that might be the case? Uh, I feel like we should wait till after you've given us the history and then we'll answer that question. I mean, Perfect. I think we all know why, but let's Let's do the content yeah, first. Let's and then dig we'll... into this. Yeah. So the first thing we want to open up with that um, as I was kind of combing through the research on this and what other historians and political scientists and sociologists and even a couple of anthropologists were saying is that there is a narrative problem with Tibet. Um, and there is this competition between Western discourses about what sovereignty means in terms of creating a nation state and what autonomy is and things along those lines. But I, I guess I have a question for, for Nick being the sociologist. Do you think Western discourses about sovereignty and autonomy and nation state building and things along those lines, the things that we've talked about, like ad nauseum on this podcast, do you think they even fit here in in what maybe Tibet is seeking? Or is this actually kind of a a soft colonialism in a way in terms of using political uh, terms? that apply more to the West than they would to the East, especially in the case of a, a culture and place and region that has got thousands of years of history. What do you think? Well, I think there's probably two things going on. The first is what you just said, where like our concept of a nation doesn't apply, you know, fully when we start talking about the East, though I think, you know, when we look at the work of like a James C. Scott talking about, you know, the art of not being governed, et cetera, he's talking about you know, Asia, the step, et cetera. So he's in that space talking about how the state is encroaching on, you know, the state list and so forth. So I, I don't know if that's at play. What I do think is at play, though, is that the Western, you know, sort of ideal of autonomy, and specifically in this case, the autonomous nation, is really like we pick and choose on who we apply that to and who gets the right to be autonomous and who doesn't based on our own interests. Right. So if it doesn't really interest us or if it's too dangerous for us to intervene, then all of a sudden we don't really care about autonomy. And another modern example that's perfect is Ukraine. Right. Well, mm. Russia is really scary. So we're going to, you know, after a year or two, we'll send them a few tanks. But other than that, we're going to kind of bow out of that whole thing. You know what I mean? Like it, we just draw lines where it, it's too dangerous or it doesn't really serve us to, respect the autonomy of other countries. Yeah, that's such a good connection as well. Um, The other thing um, when we think about narrative is the idea that China itself, the People's Republic of China, being the colonial power that we're going to draw into critical inquiry here is also co-opting those narratives. And as China, um, I don't want to accuse them of moving Western in terms of ideology and things along those lines, but they borrow a couple from uh, here and there, I guess, just being part of like the globalized world. Everyone's kind of borrowing here and there from, from different discourses. They have also began to co-opt those and decide what sovereignty and nation states mean um, in terms of their narrative regarding not just Tibet, but of course, um, there's the Taiwan question and there's what's going on with the Uyghurs and so on and so forth. So um, as they become more imperial, they're starting to co-opt those narratives and in fact, um, in my research, I, I came across a scholar in the Tibet Journal. Um, their name is Ja Thinli Gyatso. Again, excuse my pronunciation. 
they essentially assert that the way we think about Tibet is through discourses woven by one of two things, either Western notions of statehood or a Chinese mythos weaving within their ordering of history to rationalize their present. In other words, um, the term we use ad nauseum on this channel, the ethically constitutive story in China continues to evolve to rationalize basically their, their permanent occupation of Tibet. Um, Gyatso uses uh, Michel Foucault, who we've also talked about at this, on this channel a, a great deal, his government narratives in, and I quote, in what has been understood as governmental rationality, which creates conditions to governable spaces in which it is inevitably situated to fulfill the government's rationalities through acceptable discourses, creating a past to respond to the present challenges. Um, Nick, being a little bit more of a Foucault expert than myself, what, what, what do we mean by governmental narratives here? I mean, in this case, it's the fact that we are constantly shifting the narrative of these governments, including the past, present, and future, to rationalize whatever actions that we, I say we, but whatever actions China, in this case, is doing at the time, right? So, you know, the term here, mythos weaving, is key, where the mythology of this nation state sort of adapts itself to rationalize whatever actions it's you know, taking part in that no nation. I mean, it's not like the only na the, China is the only nation that's done this. Every nation, I yes. think, by its nature, does this, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, they they make up their history in ways mm -hmm. that aren't about teaching the past. They're about rationalizing the present. Exactly. Um, the other thing that makes this a complicated question is there is Western colonialism involved as well. The British, of course, attempted to colonize the region. And so when they did that in the 19th century, they also added layers of colonial discourse there that further complicated. The British, of course, attempted to colonize China as well. And that was with mixed results. They, they did some horrific things there. But no one would say that, China, that England's control of China was the same as England's control of India, for example. Right. So there was definitely um, inroads being made there. Um, the interesting thing here is that when the British show up in the 19th century, there had long been this, and we're talking like millennia, um, a millennia narrative regarding the relationship between China and Tibet being more of a priest and patron relationship between the two of them. So even in times when China, we would argue is overstepping its boundary, let's say in the 13, 14, 1500s or something along those lines, um, into Tibet, it was always with this kind of priest patron relationship. Um, that would be overridden when the British show up by a, and I quote, new conception of international relations, power politics, and imperialism as the Brits and China um, end up competing for influence in Tibet. I don't know about control over Tibet, but influence um, in Tibet. What do you think I mean by the priest-patron relationship? Because this, this is something that's going to come up quite a bit in the scholarship regarding China and Tibet, as, as Tibet is the priest and China as the patron. Obviously, there's allusions here to Tibet's somewhat like very religious past, but um, what do you think I mean by that? What is a yeah, priest and that, a patron? That's exactly what I was going to say, right? It, it, these allusions to the sort of I say mysticism, but the religious history that takes place in Tibet, that was what largely had defined the narrative between the relationship between these two regions in the past, right? And like, as you said, that changes drastically once we get into, you know, start talking about the current problem. And not that this is a modern problem, it's been no. going on for a while, but you know what I mean? Right. There's also, and in the research that I, I looked up, there is also some recent scholarly hesitance, even in the West here, in calling out the People's Republic of China as either colonial or imperial. There's also a lot of scholarship on what to call them, colonial or imperial. And Nick and myself have gone back and forth on these two terms and how much they share, but what distinguishes them. I don't have time to really dig into that now. Regardless, there's been some hesitance, which is, again, is weird because one of the things that drew us to or drew me to this topic is the fact that like free to was a thing for me growing up, and now it's no longer a thing. Carol McGranahan out of the University of Colorado, uh, anthropologist, identifies four reasons why the West is increasingly scared to call out the Chinese pseudo occupation of Tibet. So I'm going to go through those and maybe get some, some of Nick's thoughts on them. The first thing she identifies is that 
there are scholarly fears of criticizing the PRC government and thus potential persecution or loss of research access. I think that's kind of obvious, but like what's what's McGranahan saying here? That scholars in the West are now scared to call out the Chinese government in this regard because they might lose their access to research within China for whatever topic they might be researching, might not mm-hmm. even be related to that, might be something else. What do you think of that? I think that's completely valid, right? Like you might be a research scholar that, like you said, has nothing to, your expertise has nothing to do with Tibet at all. But if you say anything that criticizes the Chinese government, then they'll cut your access off completely, right? Not to mention, if you happen to be a Chinese scholar that is working in the United States, you definitely don't want to criticize the government because you'll find yourself back in China real fast. Well, and we even saw this as a, both being basketball fans and whatnot. We even saw this a few years back when a bunch of NBA players who mm-hmm. China, ba- basketball is now huge in China and NBA players go there and tour and stuff like no one really wanted to call China out for what was going on in Hong Kong. Right. Exactly. Like, mm-hmm. And and everyone was scared because they didn't want to, you know, not, not not get access because of the government, but also because of the market itself. Like this is a huge market for them. Mm-hmm. So, well, I mean, yeah, even like NBA uh, not officials like the referees, but I mean, like the administration and like ESPN sportscasters. I mean, everyone was keeping so tight lipped. It was yeah. just like just ridiculous to watch. Yeah. OK, the second thing that McGranahan identifies is that there is a Marxist radical reductionism or ideological affiliation with or apology for the Chinese communist government. Now, without going into all the nuance of 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 ideology within the within uh the academy yeah i mean some would argue that the academy leans left or whatever that might be i don't know that i personally have run across a lot of like really pro maoist chinese um scholars in my life but 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 regardless um the argument here that McGranahan is making is that if even if you're slightly left leaning you are inclined to want to not call out china too much um because you're more or less apologizing perhaps for your own political beliefs, which again, you, you can do both. You could be a left leaning, but still say the Chinese government is oppressive. And actually we would argue probably not even following Marxism as closely as, as I mean, whatever Orthodox Marxism is to you, but not actually following it anyway, regardless. I, I don't know. What are your thoughts there? I mean, I do absolutely think that there is a sort of phenomenon on the left that makes people hesitate to criticize anything associated with Marxism at all, right? Um, I, like we've talked about before, we get even like Stalinist apologists on the left, <sighs> but like, you know what I mean? Like, so that exists for sure. However, like you said, I don't think that I've actually seen that in academia as much, right? It's usually like the sort of hobby Marxists. <laughs> I, I, I haven't seen a lot of the yeah. like Marxist academics being afraid to right. critique the Chinese government especially in this specific case, right? Like it's right. not, this has nothing to do with Marxism at all. In fact, it's anti-Marxist what they're doing in Tibet. So I, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and anyone, any of our listeners that are going to listen to this episode knows this is a pretty far left leaning podcast. Like, you know, I, I identify more or less in, with, with anarchism and things along those lines, but I have no problem being an equal opportunity caller out or of like human rights violations. Like I'll, I'll call out like the right wing just saying, you know, but I'll also call out the Stalin. I'm not a Stalinist or a Maoist, you know, it's, it's whatever. Anyway. Okay. Let's, let's keep moving. Well, and like you said, to your point, right. I think the Maoist sympathizers in academia are even like fewer and further between. So yeah, it's 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 a little bit ridiculous um, in that regard. So I don't I don't know about that. OK, anyway, the third reason that uh, McGranahan identifies is that there is a myopic focus on European empire. I might even be guilty of this. In fact, that's one of the reasons as I developed this course on colonial case studies, almost all of my case studies that I had prior to were Western. I'd pick on the Brits in South Africa or Kenya or India. I'd pick on the French in Algeria uh, and Morocco. I'd pick on the Spaniards and the Brits in North America. And then the Americans I would pick on when they continued to move West and did horrible things to Native Americans. And honestly, I'm willing to admit that. So that's exactly why I, I, I chose this case study is I wanted to diversify my colonial case studies. I'm also going to do Japan and Korea and things along those lines coming up. But regardless, I'm willing to admit to that one. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I buy it. You know what I mean? This seems like, (laughs) yeah, we're both guilty of this, like you said, right? When we focus on, you know, we had, in fact, I was just reading a comment the other day on YouTube, someone that said that we were uh, like, completely Eurocentric. I forget what video it was on, but I thought that was funny. 
because what they were talking about, we actually weren't being Eurocentric, but we often are. So uh, we're guilty of that for sure. Yeah. Well, oh, it was the French be- revolution. That's what it was that we were Eurocentric by saying the French revolution was the only real revolution, which I don't really think that we actually say. A lot I don't know that we ever said that. I, I think yeah. we both would argue that there's never been a real revolution exactly. by many of them, but regardless. Okay. Anyway, um, number four, the thing that the fourth thing that McGranahan ar- argues is that there are pervasive discourses of Chinese victimhood at the hands of Western empires. That's another thing that makes people hesitant. And of course, yes, China itself also had to deal with um, colonial transgressions, particularly in the 19th and early 20th century, when of course, all of the European powers and even the United States to a less extent um, are trying to get their hands on on basically that market, really that market. I, I mean, there's a bunch of lush, wonderful resources in China as well, but the market was the main thing that was driving even the Germans, the Brits, the Americans, the Russians to try and dig into, into China. I mean, we get things like boxer rebellions and opium wars and all those kinds of things. And because of those horrific things that happened to China, I, and I guess I can't leave Japan off the list, you don't get much more imperial and colonial than what Japan did to China at the beginning of the 20th century as well. But I think that victimhood is making people, or what McGranahan's saying, is making people want to be hesitant in regards to China also doing things to other places. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, 100%. I think that that's true. Um, I think that, you know, this happens in academia a lot where we, exactly this, right? We hesitate to criticize anyone who throughout history has also been a victim of, you know, colonialism, et cetera, like atrocities themselves. So we turn a blind eye to some of the atrocities that they commit. I mean, it makes no sense. I can't relate really, but I am not doing my research in this field. So I don't, I, I don't know. Yeah. Like you said, we're an equal Colorado. So I, I can't relate. Right. Well, we've laid out kind of the narratives here, and now it's time to just let's let's get through some of this history. Um, let's dig into what it is. We're going to hit some highlights. We'll probably miss some things because, again, my focuses are usually other parts of the globe, Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, the places like that. But I do think it's important that we hit some of this history. So, okay, if we skip anything that you think is super important, make sure you leave it in the comments. But we're going to go back. We're going to go back thousands of years. I'm going to do this part really quickly because this isn't the colonial part, but Nick knows and sometimes he hates it. I like to lay kind of a groundwork for like what this place is about. So I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. So I just like that you always go like, we're going to do a super brief history. And then you're like, 21,000 years ago. Yeah, yeah. It's like an hour and a half later. Okay. So real quick, but again, this is thousands of years of history. I'm going to try and like wrap it up with a well, as quickly as I can, I suppose. So in Tibetan, the region is called Bod. The word Tibet comes to us um, from layers of translations um, from the Turkic languages to eventually the Semitic languages. And essentially, Tibet means the highlands to a whole host of various peoples that live throughout Eurasia. Like this, this the, because of the, the rich history here, a lot of people have just taken on the name Tibet. And of course, because of the vast migrations of people that move across the Central Asian steppe, Tibet is the one that just stuck. And of course, highlands fits because it is super high right like that's the geography you have some of the tallest mountains in the world there um i think we all know that uh the himalayas etc okay we know that hominids uh left evidence dating back half half a million years ago but in terms of like actual humans homo sapiens they rolled into the tibet region around twenty one thousand years ago although we don't have any real history recorded until the introduction of buddhism which of course is going to play a super huge role in this history um around 500 bce um and again going through this relatively quickly the first real kingdom we have was formed by immigrants and about um also around 500 bc and it lasted till 625 c that was the Zhang Zhong kingdom. I didn't do a lot of research there because, again, it's not necessarily the focus of what we're talking about today. From there, we have the establishment of something called the Yarlung dynasty. And the reason I'm bringing them up is because essentially they are associated with the actual mythological origins of, of what we now call Tibet. Some of it was tied to Buddhism. Some of it is some um, crossover with the Mandate of Heaven belief system in China at the time. And some of it is the indigenous Um, Bon religion, which was indigenous to Tibet. The 32nd king of this dynasty, a guy named Namri um, Songsten, is credited as the originator of the Tibetan Empire, which lasted between 618 and 842 and established its base around the city of Lhasa. And that's why I'm bringing this up right here is because Lhasa is where much of this story that we're going to be talking about today takes place. It is first recognized internationally, quote unquote, as they establish embassies naturally with their closest large neighbor, China. 
Um, and it's also during this time that Buddhism begins to slowly outpace um, the Bon, the native Bon religion, um, as the main belief system in what we'll now call Tibet. After centuries, though, of fragmentation, there is a resurgence of Buddhism as we get through the 9th, 10th, 11th centuries, um, a form of Buddhism called the Pala form. And that is going to um, be imported basically from Kashmir by a monk named Atisa. This leads to something called the Tibetan Renaissance. And this is important because this is where we establish like the idea of lamas and things along those lines, at least to the best of my knowledge. Again, maybe a professional Buddhist will come in in the comment section and correct me, hopefully. Everything's put on hold in the 13th century like it is throughout Central Asia because of the Mongol invasions. I uh, don't have time to go through all of them. Everyone knows that the Mongols, of course, um, conquered a vast majority of the world at this moment in time. Tibet was no different. Um, they actually, the Tibetans had contact with the Mongols during the rise of the very famous Genghis or Chinggis Khan's life, which led to an imperial subservience relationship to the Mongols. But the Mongols, for some reason, unlike where they went to China or even in the Middle East, where they were super bloodthirsty, they weren't quite as bloodthirsty in Tibet. Um, they actually had a lot of respect for Tibetan Buddhism and their uh, educators there. In fact, major issues, if they arose with this relationship with the Mongols, were taken up by a whole um, system called the Bureau of Buddhist and Tibetan Affairs that was developed by the Mongols um, as they were ruling from Beijing um, during their peak uh, called the Yuan Dynasty. In fact, Tibetan priests and advisors rose in the Mongol courts, Kublai Khan's courts, and they became some of the most trusted teachers. They were well respected by Mongols. In fact, all Mongol governors usually had Tibetan monks um, on their their court staff. Uh, what do you think of that? Like, I, I guess I, mean, I know this isn't like your expertise or even your area of history that you've done a lot of research in, but like we we picture the Mongols a certain way as super bloodthirsty and conquering the world. And they did these things, they did these things. But when it came to the Tibetans, like, I, I, I guess I'm just curious, can you theorize why they respected the Tibetans so much more than some of the, the Muslims that they conquered or the Chinese that they conquered or even the Russians that they conquered? What do you, what do you think of that? I mean, all I can hear is that something to do with the Buddhist, you know, religion, sort of the spirituality, like in the, in the region, you know. Well, one of the predominant religions of Mongolia now is Buddhism, and this conversion of Mongols took place during this period of time. Anyway, after the fall of the Yuan Dynasty in Beijing, Tibet is left relatively independent as the rise of the Ming Dynasty um, takes place um, in China. Uh, essentially in Tibet, you have families ruling things. There's the eventual ascendance of what we now call the Dalai Lama. There's been 14 of them. We'll get to that later. Um, the Ming dynasty eventually loses its mandate of heaven um, in China and the Qing dynasty, excuse me, takes over. The Qing dynasty is able to use some factional conflicts that rose in Tibet. These factional conflicts um, were between like landed estate families and sectarian Buddhist um, factions. Essentially, Buddhism kind of splinters a little bit during this time period. The Qing dynasty is able to use this splintering to consolidate some power in the region, and that lasts through about the 18th century. Um, that was super brief history. Now let's get into some colonialism. See, I went through that one relatively quickly, but mm -hmm. all right. The Europeans end up showing up in the 18th century, and anytime the Europeans show up anywhere, basically between the 14 and 19 and into the 1900s, um, shit's going to get bad. They are horrific everywhere they go. They're horrific in North America. They're horrific in South America. They're horrific in Africa. They're horrific in Southeast Asia. This is not going to go well for anybody usually, right? Uh-oh, Europeans arrive. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> I mean, anything to add there? I know. Nope. That's, yeah, that's it. it. Yeah, like this is going to go poorly for everybody when the whites show up. Okay, the Portuguese are among the first that have early forays into what we would now call Tibet. In the 17th century, they start doing missionary work like they had been doing everywhere else, um, including when they started the transatlantic slave trade. Um, they want to establish their brand of Catholicism within the region. The British themselves also start to trickle in in the 18th and 19th century, given Tibet's proximity to their other colonies. Of course, their crown jewel of a colony India. Um, England is also competing for influence throughout Central Asia in what we would now call the various stands, the Afghanistans and the Tajikistans and the Turkmenistans and so on and so forth. They're in what we call the great game with um, Tsarist Russia, right? Both competing for influence in this region, which leads to a whole host. I mean, we brought it up before on podcasts when we were talking about Iran or the Kurds and things along those lines. Um, England does formally invade what we now call Tibet in 1903, which leads to the semi-famous 1905 Tibetan Rebellion. 
Um, and after this rebellion, this led to the assertion of Qing control. So once Tibet, of course, kind of forces, a, to, an, to an extent, forces the British out. The British weren't trying super hard like they were in India. But once they forced the British out, they actually, the Qing used this as a way um, to reassert their control over the region. And if you're choosing the lesser of evils uh, between England and Qing Dynasty China, you're going to choose Qing Dynasty China, the, the, the mm -hmm. villain I suppose you know, right? The evil you know rather than the one you don't. Anyway, after this period, um, Tibet itself is left in relative isolation um, to create some formative years here between 1912 and 1951. As the world wars are, are going on outside of there, the, I mean, they are affected. Everywhere is affected. Um, this makes me think of the, the the film Seven Years of Tibet, um, Seven Years in Tibet with Brad Pitt, where he plays like a German um, who technically is a Nazi, but doesn't even really know what that means because he's in Tibet while this is all going on. And and so on and so forth. Anyway, it's during this period that, that Tibet's left with um, a lot of autonomy because there's so much else going on in the world. There's Chinese rebellions. China's actually engaged in somewhat of a civil war between nationalists and communists and so on and so forth. That orients almost all attention away from Tibet. Lhasa itself um, asserts political control over the region. So it becomes kind of a metropole where some of the other provinces, because Tibet's huge. Tibet is a huge geographic region. Lhasa asserts some political control even over the provincial regions. There's going to be a couple of short skirmishes with China. There's even the 1932 like Sino-Tibetan War, which isn't quite as blo bloody as the other wars going on in China throughout the early 20th century. Essentially, this, this really begins with the rise of something called the Tibetan Improvement Party under Ragpa, uh, and excuse my pronunciation, Pang Datsang, um, who was an independence-minded leader, um, but he only, always had an eye towards like the modernization of Tibet, which would contrast some people in Tibet, like what they wanted. He was in contrast to the Dalai Lama's version of Tibet. He himself was affiliate, affiliated with the Guamandong. Um, he even saw Sun Yat-sen as a hero and don't have time to go into like Sun Yat-sen's past, but he's kind of a nationalist hero in China. Rogpa himself ends up being feared not just by like by like the communist China that's going to rise to power, but he's also feared by the British who are still in India in the 1930s. Keep in mind, India doesn't get its independence until the 1940s. They actually saw him as a potential Chinese spy for what they've got going on um, throughout Southeast Asia. Also, as an interesting little aside, this is where Tibet itself, though, there's some Western fascination with Tibet and Buddhism. It's actually born during this area as Brit Britain sent people into Tibet to do some like exploration, but also like kind of feel things out and see what this Ragpa guy was doing. And a couple of guys named Sir Charles Bell and Hugh Richardson start this whole like Western understanding of Tibetan studies, where again, the West briefly is going to be almost obsessed with Tibet and Buddhism and things along those lines. Um, anything that you want to like chime in on regarding that, like kind of brief history? I don't think so. Okay. So our focus for colonization, however, again, even though England and, and, and Qing dynasty have been doing things, the real version of colonization we want to get to starts in 1950, right? That's where our focus really kicks off. The Chinese communist, the Chinese communist revolution, as most of our listeners probably already know, ends in October of 1949 with Mao Zedong and the communist or the Chinese communist party, um, coming out on top. But bear in mind, this is key, regardless of who won that revolution, whether it was going to be the nationalists and the Guamandong or the communists, both parties would have asserted Tibet needs to be under Chinese sovereignty. So no, neither party was going to be like, hey, let's, let's, let's liberate Tibet and allow it to be its own nation state. And this is kind of important to keep in mind. By October 7th of 1950, the People's Republic of China um, formally did invade the Chamdo region um, of Tibet, securing a very swift victory. Obviously, the, Tibet had a military, mind you, but it's not a super strong military and not nearly going to be big enough to defeat the People's Republic of China's army. So the, the victory is relatively swift. After this victory, there was a lot of pressure on the Dalai Lama, seen, of course, as the leader of the 13th Dalai Lama, or the 14th Dalai Lama, seen as the leader of the region. He's going to be forced to sign something called the 17-point agreement on May 23rd of 1951. He signs this under what is called under duress. Um, and he signs it despite the protests from many of his subjects, as well as like the Kashan, which is known as, which is the Tibetan cabinet. So his advisors and things along those lines. And there's a little bit of checks and balances there with this cabinet and the Dalai Lama. They are protesting his signing of it, but it's eventually going to be ratified. The under duress language, though, that is used to describe this is going to be used by a whole host of international powers to challenge the legitimacy of this agreement. I'm going to go through a couple of the points on this agreement real quick, because it is, it's a very important 
important primary source for this time period. It kind of lays things out. Um, anything before I, I kick this off? Nope. Okay, so the first point on the 17-point agreement is that the Tibetan people shall be united and drive out the imperialist aggressive forces from Tibet, that the Tibetan people shall return to the big family of the motherland, the People's Republic of China. And again, keep in mind, the Dalai Lama ends up signing this, I don't want to say at gunpoint, but kind of at gunpoint, like like not literal gunpoint, there's not, I don't know that there was, but like, again, you've got tanks and artillery all like kind of surrounding Tibet at this point in time. So yes, this is where he signs it. But it's interesting to say that this language that we see in here, and again, the translation into English probably is missing something. I'm willing to admit that. But the fact that he signs on to something that says China is the motherland, what do you think of that? I mean, that sets up so many other things, you know? Yeah. It also says that the local government of Tibet shall actively assist the People's Liberation Army to enter Tibet and consolidate the national defenses. So basically, he's signing away the fact that the People's Liberation Army of China gets to basically operate in Tibet with no checks. Mm -hmm. The The third thing is that in accordance with the policy towards nationalities laid down in the common program of the Chinese People's Political Consultation Conference... The, Tibet, the Tibetan people have the right of exercising national sovereign, national regional autonomy under the unified leadership of the central people's government. So it's basically saying you'll have a, you can at least have some local government underneath our government. So you'll still have to answer to us. I don't know any thoughts there. I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I equate this for um, something that we're a little bit more familiar with here in the West. What was going on with the creation of reservation governments here during? Um, the colonial period in the United States where mm-hmm. they're conquering these indigenous groups and they're saying, oh, you can have some of your own officials, right? Your own quote unquote chiefs, but they still answer to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, right? Yeah, I don't 100%. know. Mm-hmm. The fourth thing is that the central authorities will not alter the existing political system in Tibet. They're still going to, essentially they're saying there's still going to be a Dalai Lama and there's still going to be the, uh, the, the Tibetan cabinet. The central authorities also will not alter the established status functions and powers of the Dalai Lama. Officials of various ranks shall hold office as usual. The established status, functions, and powers of the Panchen, um, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce this um, at all, shall be maintained. In case you're wondering, listeners, the Panchen is the second in command under the Dalai Lama. The Panchen is, so that's that's essentially what that means. Um, by the established status, functions, and powers of the Dalai Lama and the Panchen, it is meant that the status, functions, and powers of the 13th Dalai Lama and the 9th Panchen when they were in friendly and amicable relations with each other. They're basically saying we want to get back to that relationship where the first in command and the second command actually were getting along and they worked with China. That's essentially what they're saying there. The list goes on and on and on. I don't know that I want to hit every one of these. I'll hit a couple more highlights here. I'm not going to hit all 17, but one that really stuck out to me is that um, number 12 says, insofar as the former pro-imperialist and pro-KMT Guamandong officials resolutely serve uh, sever relations with relations with the imperialism and the KMT and do not engage in sabotage or resistance. They may continue to hold office irrespective of their past. So basically, if you were in Tibet and at any point you were affiliation, affiliated with the nationalists, the Guamandong, you will sever your relationship with them. You are no longer to even, which again, I don't know if that's a huge surprise, but it's going to be important moving forward. He also says that the People's Liberation Army entering Tibet will abide by the above mentioned policies and will be fair in all buying and selling and will not arbitrarily take even a needle or a thread from the people. Um, Anyway, uh, essentially, all of this is going to basically lead to a subservient rule for Tibet underneath the People's Republic of China, where at least on paper, it looks like they'll have a couple of freedoms, but basically they're going to operate as a province of China. That's essentially what that means. And Tibet at this point in time doesn't feel like it has any choice, right? Like they've just lost um, this, this large region to the east in their provinces, the Chando region. They feel like they have to they have to actually sign on to this. The Dalai Lama feels very pressured. Um, so anyway... Essentially, under the 17-point agreement between 1951 and 1959, colonial incursion by China into Tibet is minimal. There is some infrastructure projects that are going to be taken up. There's also going to be the stationing of 20,000 troops from the People's Liberation Army. Lhasa itself, the administration, even received some subsidies um, to help um, economically, and the Dalai Lama was allowed to continue to have symbolic leadership but not really a whole lot of political leadership, despite what the 17-point agreement laid out. However, um, many Tibetans are not happy with this relationship. They're not happy with the 17-point agreement. They're not happy with the fact that 20,000 troops are stationed throughout Tibet. 
And as of 1956, a couple of the more eastern regions, Amdo and Kham, um, they start to see some changes that they are really not thrilled with. One of those is land reform. Essentially, China starts to create these, these land communes and they start putting um, – all of these quotas on production and things along those lines that that Tibet was just not used to. They never had to deal with this in thousands of years of history. Um, there's also going to be a huge crackdown on religiosity in Amdo and Kam. Essentially, this is the Chinese Communist Party essentially seeking to, well, I mean, get rid of a religion in the region. They want to get rid of the Bon religion, the ancient Bon religion. They're also cracking down on Buddhism at this moment in time. Resistance forms in this region and um not oddly enough, I was about to say oddly enough, but not oddly enough, the CIA is doing a bunch of horrific things around the world at this moment in time, supporting all kinds of, of, of causes that they actually don't really understand, which is what makes some of it so horrible. But they do decide, the United States Central Intelligence Agency does decide to support Tibetan resistance. Um, this is, of course, all in secret, as much of what the CIA does, right? It's all clandestine. They tried to support resistance movements and guerrilla war tactics um, in Amdo and Kham region. And they fail miserably. They are crushed. The CIA itself isn't, but the resistance fighters that they are funding are crushed by the People's Liberation Army. At least 10,000 Tibetans died um, during this, between 1956 and 1959, more or less, during um, this this clandestine guerrilla fighting that was going on in eastern Tibet. Um, real quickly, um, why do you think the CIA had any interest in Tibet? We've talked about the CIA numerous times on this podcast. We talked about how um, they horrifically overthrew democracy in Iran in 1953. We talked how they overthrew um, democracy in Guatemala in 1954. We've talked about them before, what they're doing here in the 1950s under the auspices of Cold War. And I guess I kind of already answered the question there. But like, what do you want to add to that? What, what do you think their interest is in Tibet? Yeah, every time we talk about the CIA in this period, it's they're doing something irrational as a result of the specter of communism. Like that, that's it, right? Whether it's Iran, anything you just said, they're like freaking out about they the did. expansion. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The expansion of communism around the world, right? So this clearly is, you know, just one other in their mind. And I mean, maybe realistically, you know, battlefront against communist expansion. Right. And, and and it's even harder here, like in Guatemala or in Iran or even in Cuba, like the, the, the CIA definitely is is supporting like bad guys. But mm -hmm. here they're kind of supporting. I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of on the side of Tibetan res resistance right. fighters. So this one's a little bit tougher, but they also don't do a good job of supporting because they end up getting crushed. And we'll talk about that, what that means later. The CIA is not very well received to this day in Tibet. But OK. This leads to the most famous part of, of, of this history that has honestly laid a lot of the groundwork for what we're seeing today, the 1959 Tibetan uprising. Um, essentially, Tibetans are seeking a renewed reputation um, after rebellions in Amdo and Kham, the People's Republic of China, excuse me, I should say that the PRC seeking renewed reputation in Tibet after the rebellions in Amdo and Kham are crushed. Um, they pressure the Dalai Lama to attend a whole host of holiday festivals for basically public relations reasons. The goal was to, just to get, you know, obviously um, footage and stories out that the Dalai Lama is hanging out with members of the Chinese Communist Party and they're going to these, these festivities, essentially. And it's also showing that the PRC respects some of the Tibetan festivities and that the Dalai Lama respects some Chinese festivities and so on and so forth. Essentially, that's the goal here. But this meeting never really goes down. There's disagreement about the time and place where... Um, the Dalai Lama and the PRC um, officials are basically supposed to hang out um, and watch these festivities. Um, the Kashang, again, the Tibetan cabinet, really says, like, Dalai Lama, don't go. You're going to be abducted. They're actually using this as an excuse to steal you away and disappear you, basically. Protesters in Lhasa end up surrounding the Dalai Lama's palace to make sure he actually doesn't leave. They're, they're basically trying to block him in so he doesn't go um, and get abducted. Um, by uh, basically the Chinese spies, right? Essentially, that's what they see it as. So essentially, they're trying to protect him. The protesters also start to uh, target, and these are my terms, not theirs, but essentially what we would call like sellout llamas, llamas that were being um, too acquiescent to the People's Republic of China, people that were trying to work with them and maybe even um, remove certain Tibetan traditions. Um, Basically, to, to try and keep them safe, we might argue, this is, a, I mean, you're in a very difficult position if you're some of these, what we would call sellout llamas. Do you want to protect your people from the aggressive People's Liberation Army? Are you going to have to make concessions? But at the same time, are those concessions essentially leading to assimilation? I, it'd be a very difficult position to be in. 
One of those sellout llamas, um, and I, again, this is our term, sellout is what I don't know that the Tibetans would use this term, was called Pagbala Soinam Gyamko. He ends up being killed by the protesters. And again, excuse my pronunciation. This all ends up leading to calls for outright independence and Lhasa. So essentially what we see at this point in time, we're calling it a rebellion, but they're calling for revolution in Tibet. This erupts into a full-blown call for independence and Lhasa. And the People's Liberation Army begins to deploy troops towards Lhasa. Uh, they end up setting artillery, all aimed at the palace in Lhasa, which of course could go very poorly for the Tibetans. A nonviolent demonstration during this period of time also breaks out, and it's led by Pamo Kusang. This birds the Tibetan women's movement. And this is important because this is a movement that is still alive and well today and is still well-renowned all over the world. They send out speakers, or at least when they can, when they can get out of China, or, well, Tibet, I should say, when they're able to get out of China. Um, this movement becomes very important um, in terms of, again, getting a Tibetan voice out to the world to discuss what is going on regarding Chinese imperialism within Tibet. Um, one of these women ends up being executed and becomes in a very important martyr towards the movement. Her name is Gerteng Kunsong. Um, so anyway, that's taking place at this time. Artillery eventually is launched to try and kind of douse this movement early on into Lhasa. These artillery strikes into Lhasa end up um, prompting the Dalai Lama to flee on March 18th of 1959. This is, of course, an important day because the Dalai Lama essentially hasn't been back. Um, he flees on March 18th of 1959. He links up with calm rebels who take him to the Indian border where he establishes um, essentially like a Tibet within India. And India, of course, allows him to live in exile there. Um, so, yeah, that's what takes place. He uh, essentially declares that Tibet should be independence from there. So when the Dalai Lama calls for independence from India, that's him breaking the 17 point agreement. So that's why that's important. Anything there that you want to discuss or um, add a little bit to? I don't think so. I have questions, but I'm assuming we'll get to them. So not yet. Okay. There will be two days of fighting after the Dalai Lama flees in Lhasa, where protesters and the Tibetan army are going to clash until the People's Liberation Army itself on March 20th unleashes tanks. And again, the Tibetans don't really have tanks. So this, this becomes very one-sided. The tanks are used to break through uh, various blockades that have been put into Lhasa, and the Chinese flag would be raised above Lhasa. There are a number of deaths uh, that take place. We don't actually have like formal counts of them, but we do know about 4,000 people are going to be uh, arrested. It's at this point where we get some of the content that will come in the form of the 70,000 character petition, which is uh, put together by the Panchen Lama, the Sankit Reking Lama in Tibet. And I just have a couple of quotes from that that I want to talk about re that relate to what took place. So in the 70,000 70, character petition, there's a couple of interesting things that the Panchen Lama mentions during the 1959 uprising. He says, we have no way of knowing how many people were arrested. In each region, there were at least 10,000 arrests. So that goes well above the 4,000 I mentioned that, that I got. I'm going to be blunt from like Chinese sources like that was. So the, but he's saying there were like tens of thousands of arrested. He says, good and bad, innocent and guilty, all were imprisoned in contradiction with any legal system in the world. In some areas, most of the men were imprisoned, leaving only women, the elderly, and children to work. Real quickly, why do you think the People's Republic or the Pe People's Liberation Army would arrest mostly men? I mean, I think the reasons are obvious, but what was the goal there? I mean, anyone who might become a soldier. Okay, but we also know there was a strong women's movement. Why did they arrest more men than women? Some might also say that this is an attempt at changing the demographic of the region. We've seen this before, this kind of soft form of manipulating populations. And we'll get to that because that's actually going to be something China is going to attempt to do mm -hmm. to try and essentially change the gene pool. Um, we find out that numerous prisoners dies of, died of afflictions after the introduction of the dictatorship of the proletariat, especially in Tibet. The pro population of Tibet found itself in considerably reduced circumstances these last few years. Besides the aged women and children, most able-bodied and intelligent men from the Tibetan regions of Qinghai, Gansu, Sichuan, and Yunnan provinces were imprisoned. They even ordered the killing of rebel families. Officials deliberately put people in jail under draconian conditions, so there was a lot of unjustifiable deaths. And again, this 
this is a document, a, a famous primary source written by the Panchen Lama himself. It's called the 70,000 70, Character Petition. Um, in case any of our listeners want to go look that up, you can find it online. It's readily available. It's, it's usually open access. Okay. It's after this conquest in 1959 by the People's Liberation Army where settler colonialism begins. Now, settler colonialism is a very specific type of colonialism used by the settlement of like non-military individuals. You're literally sending settlers out there and you're overwhelming the indigenous population with just your people. And they start bringing their lifestyle and their culture and their values and all of those things. We've seen settler colonialism. We talked about it in our episode on what the Brits did in Tasmania. We've talked about it in our Myth is America series about what the Brits and then the Americans did to Native Americans. Um, Settler colonialism is one of the, we talked about it obviously in Kenya where the Brits were there. Settler colonialism I like this definition here, is a settler colonial relationship, and it is one that is characterized by a particular form of domination. That is, it is a relationship where power, in this case, interrelated discursive and non-discursive facets of economic, gendered, racial, and state power have been structured into a relatively secure or sedimented set of hierarchical social relations that continue to facilitate the dispossession of indigenous peoples of their lands and self-determining authority. That definition Comes to, comes to us from Glenn Coltard. Uh, he's a Canadian political scientist. What do you think of that definition um, regarding settler colonialism? Now we're back in theory a little bit, and so more your wheelhouse. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean that's it. That's what they do. Right? <laughs> that's that's what you think of it. He nailed it. Nailed it. Yeah, they send in the settlers to like you, your word was perfect, right? Overwhelm essentially the land and the culture. Settler colonialism during this period of time is also tough because the Chinese themselves, these settlers, are also actually suffering a little bit because of the policies of, of, of the Chinese Communist Party and what's going on in China. And there is no better example of that than what's going to take what I'm about to talk about now, the Great Leap Forward. I'm not going to do the, the full-blown Chinese version. There's entire, I mean, we could literally spend days talking about the Great Leap Forward and all of its ramifications. I only want to kind of talk about it in relation to into Tibet. Tibet being now officially, quote unquote, part of China, at least in China's mind, they are going to have to deal with the policies of the Great Leap Forward. The Great Leap Forward essentially lasts between 1958 and 1962, and it is an economic and social campaign authored more or less by Mao and his minions with little foresight. And the goal was to essentially reconstruct an agrarian economy economy through the creation of people's communes. But it, it is so suspect to corruption. It is suspect to actually, again, as I mentioned, a complete lack of foresight. It is poorly planned. It is poorly executed. Um, And to be blunt, you're taking uh, regions, and this isn't just in Tibet, throughout China that have successfully sustained food, um, food economies for thousands of years. And you're trying to flip those over in four years. It, it just does not work. You're trying to change everything about how they operate in just four years. And it leads to, um, well, what many call, um, one of the worst man-made disasters of all time really is what it's going to lead to. Um, part of the problem is that there were anti ritus campaigns that are also then associated with food surpluses and quotas. And essentially, these anti ritus campaigns would take food, export it from places that needed it, and put, take it to places that actually already had food, leaving farmers with no food to distribute in their own regions. And how that was tied to a political anti ritus campaign, of course, is a little bit murky, but essentially they were arguing that a lot of these farmers, by hoarding, are, are to be blunt, capitalists, right? They are part of the bourgeoisie. Um, and they weren't actually hoarding at this moment in time. Again, I'm usually not an, an apologist for, uh, in this case, like landlords and landed estates and things along those lines. But they did have thousands of years of established relationships with the local population on how food was going to be distributed and purchased and sold or purchased and um, produced and things along those lines. That's cut off out of nowhere in the name of these communes, which leads to starvation. Um, if you ended up challenging these anti ritus campaigns, you were either disappeared Um, You were captured and imprisoned, or you were oftentimes executed on the spot. The other thing that the Great Leap Forward was seeking in a lot of these rural regions was industrialization. Well, they're rural regions for a reason. Like the China is huge; it has a very diverse geography and ecology. And seeking industrialization in regions that just were not equipped for industrialization took precious resources and labor from regions that needed it. And essentially, what we have here is a misappropriation of resources um, for failed industrial product projects, is what I should say. 
The other thing that takes place in The Great Leap Forward is that there is forced labor. A lot of people are forced to go into manual labor that didn't want it. And a lot of them become literal ditch diggers. They force irrigation projects all throughout the region to try and create more food re resources where food wasn't traditionally grown. Many of these people are overworked to death. We have an untold number of people that died essentially in these labor camps that were creating um, places of irrigation um, to create, again, farmland that didn't prior exist. One of the other overlooked things that we think about in during colonial projects, we brought it up, uh, brought it up a little bit with Tasmania. We brought it up a little bit with Native Americans um, regarding like the ecology of the region. Colonial projects always seek to reinvent the ecology, right, the environment. Um, to dominate the environment. And one of the things that happens during the Great Leap Forward is they unleash what is known as the Four Pests Campaign, where they are going to eliminate four pests that they've identified, again, erroneously identified as pests. Unfortunately, when you eliminate an entire species from that, that environment, you are absolutely destroying the ecology. The ecology of every environment we now know is based on a very complex web of relationships um, that go back and forth. There's not really a hierarchy or a pyramid as we as, as we used to learn. It's actually a complex web. So even if you eliminate something there um, that you think isn't all that important, it actually messes up the ecology a great deal. So the four pests that are identified are rats, flies, mosquitoes, and sparrows. Mosquitoes even gave me, the animal lover here, a pause. I'm like, wow, mosquitoes do really suck. But like eliminating them altogether does mess up with the ecology of these regions. And when you get rid of the rats, the flies, the mosquitoes, and the sparrows, this messes up these very complex systems, um, which leads to further and further problems. In fact, when you uh, eliminate the sparrows, the sparrows actually preyed upon locusts and other devastators of crops. So when you get rid of the sparrows, you got rid of the natural predators of these locusts and the locusts begin to devastate crops. And of course, you're doing this during a famine. So there's less crops exacerbating the problem. There also ends up being a misappropriation of false surpluses, surpluses that were misreported, or as I talked during the anti ritis campaign part, that they will be shipped to other parts of China that actually did have a surplus, and they're being taken places, uh, taken from places that did not have a surplus, and so food would be misappropriated. All in all, the Great Leap Forward, depending on your source, leads to, at the minimum, it seems like the minimum I found is about 15 million deaths throughout China. On the high end, it's about 55 million deaths. And of course, every source has has a different um, rationale as to how they came up with their nu the number. But it doesn't matter what number we're talking about. We're talking millions of deaths um, because of choices made um, by Mao and the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, the Pension Lama, in his report in 1962, a later report, he had this to say. He said, there was never such an event in the history of Tibet. People could not even imagine such horrible starvation in their dreams. In some areas, if one person catches a cold, then it spreads to hundreds and large numbers just simply die. So there's just not medicine being distributed. People are starving to death. They're being worked to death. They're being disappeared. What do you think of the Great Leap Forward? I mean, like you said, we could spend days talking about this and people have, you know, there's massive histories of what happened here. But like you explained, it's, it was just a complete disaster on so many different fronts. But, I mean, none of it worked well, you know what I mean? Except maybe the industrialization of like the big urban areas, which were already on their path to industrialization anyway. Yeah, Shanghai, so, Beijing. Yeah. Yeah, it was terrible. Like you said, millions and millions, tens of millions of people died. It was an right. atrocity. Even two years into the Great Leap Forward, the international community had already taken notice. Um, essentially, the International Commission of Jurists, the IJC, unleashes a report or authors of unleashes, like it's like, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ah, it's like it's like, immediately i was thinking of like dragon ball z they're like mm -hmm. powering up and their, their report like yeah anyway all right uh tibet and the chinese people's republic to the un that's what their report is called at this point in time they use numerous sources they're basically accusing china of a whole bunch of human rights violations based on recent decisions made regarding united nations resolutions and they essentially call the occupy occupation of tibet specifically during the great leap forward genocidal it says and i quote well dalai lama says and i quote he says the ultimate chinese aim with regard to tibet as far as i can make out seems to attempt the extermination of religion and culture and even the absorption of the Tibetan race. Besides the civilian and military personnel already in Tibet, 5 million Chinese settlers have arrived in eastern and northeastern So, 
in addition to which 4 million Chinese settlers are planned to be sent to Yuan Song provinces of central Tibet. Many Tibetans have been deported, thereby resulting in the complete absorption of these Tibetans as a race, which is being undertaken by the Chinese. Essentially, this is the Dalai Lama in 1959. There's a press conference that's cited in the report above. He's accusing China of, of outright genocide at this point in time. What do you think of that? Yeah, I, 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 it's tough because I go back and forth on this. Like, not that it wasn't an atrocity, it clearly was, but how much of it was, like, intentional, right? It's, like, just this, like, falling house of cards that, like, no one person was orchestrating. It was just a massive disaster by, you know, ineptitude across the board, across this massive country. So I struggle a little bit with the genocide attack, not because millions of people didn't die and it wasn't like a disaster, but because I don't think that it was actually calculated. You know what I mean? But I, I mean, also we'll, don't have a problem with it. So I was like, we'll revisit this maybe towards the end because like it becomes a little bit more apparent maybe later. I don't know. Some of it is calculated. I th Well, and this is my opinion. Regardless, the report itself here, we'll go through the report. We're not actually. Well, not let me say, like, it was absolutely calculated what they were doing, yeah. but they weren't actually trying to kill 55 million people as oh, a result. Okay, That's you what mean, I, during the, I see what yeah. you're saying. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, anyway, I, and the report is 349 pages. So, listeners, I'm not going through all of it, but I do want to hit like the highlights of what they're talking about. Essentially, the whole first chapter of this report produced by the IJC is evidence relating to genocide. So, it, it essentially it, it's broken up into sections. First, there is this attempt to destroy Buddhism in Tibet. Basically, they have all of these Chinese statements and from Chinese sources basically stating, we want to destroy Buddhism in Tibet, which is not genocide, but it is attempts at assimilation. It is under the auspices. Well, I mean, we'll get to that in just a second. Although There's I will say, people. like, anytime you implement the strategy of removing all the men so that you can modify the genetic and, pool, yes. like, that's genocide. Yeah. Like, sorry. Yeah that's, that's sur yeah, that's where we're going with this. There's Chinese acts and statements from Tibetan sources. There's evidence of systematic design to destroy religious belief, the intention of by killing to destroy a religious group. There is destruction by inflicting grievous bodily or mental harm. There is inflicting conditions of life calculation to bring about physical destruction. There are measures designed to prevent births and there are forcible transfer of children to another group, which we'll talk a little bit more about here in a second. That's all within the first chapter of this IJC report, which is basically their backing, telling the UN the Chinese are attempting a form of genocide here. There's a whole bunch of other things in these next couple of chapters regarding human rights and progress and, and, and actually aims for a potential um, agreement for peaceful liberation of Tibet. I'm not going to dig into those right now. Again, this is open source at this point on the internet. So if you are curious about this very important report, it is called the, IJ, uh, the IJC Report on Tibet and the Chinese People's Republic to the UN. Okay, anyway... After the failures of the Great Leap Forward, China, uh, the People's Republic of China has some PR that it needs to um, to deal with for actually its, its very own people, and Tibet is going to be no different. They try and placate uh, many of the Tibetans by establishing what is known as the TAR, or the Tibet Autonomous Region in 1965. Um, that word right there, autonomous, it basically says you're, we're giving you a little bit of autonomy. There's still at the end of the day going to be an answering to the, the PRC, but we'll give you a little bit of autonomy here. The head of government would be an ethnic Tibetan in this region. They would allow that. However, that ethnic Tibetan would always be subordinate to the first secretary of the Tibet Autonomous Regional Committee of the Chinese Communist Party, which of course would be somebody that was ethnically Han Chinese essentially. So Again, it's kind of like that relationship between Native American reservations and, and boarding schools or the BIA. Um, I should say not the boarding schools. We'll get to those in just a second. Um, it's very similar in that regard, like where there's this illusion of autonomy and maybe for super small issues, we won't even get involved. But for anything important, economic, political, um, societal, we're going to get involved. You're going to have to answer to us. Um, this also happens um, to coincide with another great measure. I, I don't want to say great as in great that it was good, but great as in that it is large in scale. Mao's Cultural Revolution, which kicks off the very following year. Um, it starts in 1966 and basically lasts until his death in 1976. This cultural revolution hits Tibet. The goal of Mao's cultural revolution was to preserve Chinese communism by purging remnants of capitalist 
and traditional elements from Chinese society. That's more or less the stated goal. This is important. Um, it's essentially Mao, Mao Zedong's second wind after receding a bit, after the failures of the Great Leap Forward. He kind of takes a step back. and and But nope, I'm coming back strong in 1966 with the Cultural Revolution. He even... Um, um, publishes the Little Red Book, his very famous Little Red Book, and that is created as propaganda that's going to be handed out to all the Chinese citizens, and this is why we're doing this. But I want to go back to his goal. We understand why they want to preserve Chinese communism by purging remnants of capitalism. Fine, we get that. Like This is the Cold War. There's this idea of incongruity between these, thesis and antithesis, whatever. Yes, dialectic method, got all that. Why would he also want to purge the traditional elements, though, from Chinese society? What's, what, what, what is the point there? That's just, it's very difficult. I think it leads back to what we talked about at the very beginning, where we're inventing a new history so that we can justify the present, right? So in order to do that, we have to sort of wipe off the face of the earth any symbol of the past that doesn't align with our version of the present and the future. Right. So getting rid of things like Confucianism, or at least attempting to, or Taoism, or in the case of Tibet Buddhism, like the, these traditional ways of knowing and understanding and living one, one's life, because I don't even want to call some of them religions. Some of them are just associated as ways of life at this point in time. By trying to purge those, that's just it doesn't go well whether you're doing it in the name of communism. It doesn't do it with, uh, well if you're doing it in the name of capitalism or any other real ism. It's, it hasn't historically worked. Right. Like the Orthodox Church survived the Soviet Union, for example. Right. Like, so why do you think they still keep to tr trying to do this? They have to know that it's not going to work, especially in a country of millions at this point in time, nearing a billion. Right. Yeah. I mean, you would think so, but no. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, yes. Okay. Um, I mean, we talked about it with Iran too, when, when the Shah is trying to get rid of Islam and things, and he's not trying to get rid of it, but basically like make it just, you know, yeah. So, okay. It doesn't work. Uh, the Red Guard is going to be used to mili militantly crack down on its own citizens throughout. They're going to police, obviously, as many Chinese citizens as they can. No doubt it's going to be worse for Tibetans, as Tibetans are still struggling to be counted by most Chinese as like actual citizens, especially since the Tibetans don't necessarily want to be citizens themselves. There's going to be a, a crackdown on the practices. So that crackdown is going to lead to the People's Liberation Army, as well as the Red Guard, cracking down on religious ceremonies in Tibet. They're going to be cracking down on education in Tibet. Really, anything that is not following um, the party line, if you're not following the party line, the Chinese Communist Party line, you're going to be persecuted, assaulted, killed, your institutions or your buildings or your structures or anything, they're going to be um, vandalized. All of that's going to take place. Essentially, in their words, um, Mao is trying to um, really root out the stinking old ninth. And that's kind of an old term in China. Basically, he's saying he's trying, the stinking old ninth are, are known as the intellectuals in China. Why do you think Mao wants to get rid of the intellectuals, whether they're Tibetan intellectuals or even Chinese intellectuals? What's the goal in getting rid of intellectuals? We see this usually from, from far right movements. Fascists hate intellectuals. Um, I'm going to call it out now, conservatives in the modern era, whether they're uh, Western conservatives, British conservatives, American conservatives, Norwegian conservatives, they also hate intellectuals. So it's usually the far right that's trying to get rid of intellectuals. Why in this case is Mao, what we would consider a leftist, also trying to get rid of intellectuals? I mean, intellectuals traditionally are the ones that are doing their critique, right? Regard of the power structure overall, regardless of whether it's conservative or progressive, or communist in this case, right? They're the critical ones. And so, you know, like you said, it's traditionally coming from the right, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to, you know? Right. Universities throughout China close. This, of course, is going to be the, uh, the case in all of the provinces, even in the uh, Tibetan Autonomous Region, although there's not a lot of universities there as in comparison to other parts of China, but like all of these are going to be closed. Urban intellectuals are then going to be collected in another part of the Cultural Revolution that is often overlooked, um, but it's called the Down to the Countryside Movement. That's the official name, where they collect these urban intellectuals and then like move them out to the sticks, to rural areas, and basically commit them to forced like labor, to try and teach them how to be like truly, quote unquote, Chinese. You're going to work hard. Or, I mean, you're going to work on a rice, rice farm. This is what we need you to do. This is what we're, and we're going to, we're going to humble you. We're going to humble you. 
Um, which is interesting. I mean, I guess I, I don't know. I mean, I've gotten different accounts of how, how badly this failed. It failed pretty badly. Like there's never an account where like, oh, this worked really well. These intellectuals were great workers and they were super into to leaving <laughs> their posts in cities and becoming farmers and, and, and being committed to manual labor. But like how many people, I guess what I'm saying is how many people actually died because of this? Uh, I'm getting, I, I get kind of mixed, mixed figures on that one. Um, any thoughts on this as a strategy, taking urban intellectuals, um, moving them to the countryside and basically committing them to forced like farm labor to teach them how to be a true Chinese peasant and what the people basically bring them down a notch. Like you are now going to be one of the people you are actually now part of the Chinese um, peasant proletariat. That's essentially what they were trying to do. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, it might function well physically, right? You're physically really locating them and giving them a different life and giving them this job. But mentally, it's not like they cease to be a critical intellectual. You know what I mean? Absolutely. During this time, five categories of black Chinese are created. And I don't mean racially. Black is just like a colored coordination. They meant like like essentially these people are bad people that have, they are bad people that have been identified by the Chinese communist party. These five categories are number one, landlords, obviously number two, rich farmers, number three, bad influencers. I like that. Well, I don't like that term, but I I like that term because it, 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 it's so you can manipulate that easy. What's yeah, a bad it's influence? Completely ambiguous. It like, be so anyone, vague. But... Yeah. Like and, and so Tibet will obviously be the one um that that qualifies as a bad influencer because you have all of these Buddhist monks and so on. You're a bad influencer on what we're trying to accomplish. Of course, people on the far right are considered part of the black category and anybody that could be considered counter-revolutionary. Those last three terms, again, are super, as you said, ambiguous or vague. You could consider anybody a counter-revolutionary, right? Or you could consider anybody a bad influence. During this time, there is an untold number of executions and disappearances during the Cultural Revolution. Tibetan resistance, though, would there would be some resistance in Tibet. It's short lived, but it is led by somebody named Thrinli Chaudron. It was a nun um, that led an army, um, or, excuse me, an army, an armed rebellion that spread through about 18 counties in Tibet. Unfortunately, it too was violently put down by the People's Liberation Army. But I like to at least mention that that, that Tibetans didn't just lay down and take it e- ever. They never have. And so I want to make sure that we continue to talk about that agency and resistance of the Tibetan people. There is this, I think, this international um, thought process that the Tibetans being like most most of them being Buddhist, that they're completely nonviolent and, and probably should be, but like whatever. But the, that they that this makes them incapable of actually resisting their own occupation, that they, that they are dependent upon the international community to come in and save them. And I, 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 I think there are examples here that indicate that's not the case that there is agency there. To this point, essentially from 1950 on, estimates range that between 400,000 and 1.25 million deaths occurred in Tibet since the occupation for all of the reasons I cited. Uh, Great Leap Forwards, cultural revolutions, uh, or cultural revolutions, um, um, putting down rebellions, those types of things. There is great debate on these figures. Again, they range from a pretty wide, there's a wide berth on this range. Um, depending the aims and sources, but even anti-People's Republic of China scholars, they also disagree on how many people in Tibet actually died because of the, the actions that took place in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Um, the death of Mao, though, presents an opportunity perhaps for the People's Republic of China and Tibet to maybe reconcile a little bit and find a way to have a peaceful resolution to their relationship. So in 1976, very famous Xiaoping um, becomes more or less the head of the Chinese Communist Party, making him more or less the head of the, 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 the acting head of the government. He invites the Tibetan exiles um, that have been um, basically scattered throughout the globe to come back to Tibet and visit Tibet and see all of the wonderful progress that has been made because of the Chinese more or less occupation of the region. Well, the Tibetan exiles that do come back look at it and they're they're basically horrified and devastated. This is not the Tibet that they left. Um, he is dead wrong here. So this first attempt at maybe reconciliation between um, China and Tibet, it, it fails. I mean, I, I think Xiaoping was well-intentioned here. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I can't get inside his brain in 1976, but I think that was the goal. Um, anyway, other People's Republic of China officials end up um, uh, promising that they will loosen the cultural oppression also during this period in 1976. Basically, when the Tibetan exiles show back up and they're horrified, they're like, okay, well, we will stop being so culturally oppressive to you and we'll even introduce some of our schools and infrastructure and work. But there is a side effect to this that is also somewhat, uh, I don't know about genocidal, but 
important because if you're going to build schools and infrastructure, which are roads, railroads, uh, uh, um, power plants, those types of things, if you're going to build that stuff in Tibet, that's going to require labor. And essentially, they're going to bring in a whole bunch of migrant labor workers to do this work. And all of those migrants are going to be ethnically Han Chinese, not Tibetan, right? So they're, 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 some accuse China of these using these projects to import a bunch of Han Chinese there and eventually out reproduce ethnic Tibetans, eventually getting rid of Tibetans that way. What do you think of that as a potential um, policy of the People's Republic of China? Just, just, just flood the region with their quote unquote own ethnicity, Han Chinese. I mean, I wouldn't think past them, right? I don't think it's out of the question. Um, in terms of international recognition of Tibet during the 70s, we have to keep in mind that the People's Republic of China, and in this case, the United States, it actually started to have relations even before Mao had passed, Mao Zedong had passed in 1972, when Richard Nixon um, uh, ends up reaching out and the United States and China basically established a relationship and the United States more or less yeah, it formally does recognize the right of the People's Republic of China to exist. It, it actually prior to that had not recognized that. The United States prior to this had always recognized the other China, the second China, which still exists, by the way, the Republic of China as the correct China. We know it now as more or less Taiwan or Formosa, if you want to go way back in time, or Chinese Taipei. But essentially, that had long been the relationship the United States being on the side of the Guangdong. Um, had sought to cultivate. Well, now in 1972, Nixon decides, hey, we need to work with the People's Republic uh, of China. And I would argue the reason for this is predominantly economic, right? Like, like this is a massive market and things along those lines. I mean, American historians have spent a lot of time like dissecting why Nixon decides to finally recognize China and, and reach out and so on and so forth. And most of it, I would argue, is economic. But anyway, moving forward, this is important because this relationship does renew some Western interest to exiled Tibetans. And these Tibetans start to seek U.S. attention regarding their human rights. They're like, okay, Americans, you say you stand for freedom and democracy and blah, 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 all the crap you say you stand for, but really don't do a good job of standing for. Well, look at us. Look at us here in Tibet. We Look at what's happening with our human rights. Look at all the violations taking place. This is where a lot of that... Um, program that Nick and I had talked about at the beginning of this episode, that 80s and 90s movement and the bumper stickers everywhere, free Tibet and bringing in Tibetan speakers, this really starts to kick off um, in the mid to late 70s. By 1987, the government in India, the Tibetan government in India out of the city of Dharamshala, um, where the Dalai Lama is hanging out still well, during all this time, had appealed enough to the United States and the international community, uh, community that the uh, House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. does pass a re resolution of support for an independent Tibet, which is cool. Like you pass, what does that mean when you pass a resolution? We're like, yeah, that's cool. We support the idea of an, an, an independent Tibet, but then like there's nothing's being done, mm -hmm. which again, coming from our, our, our podcast, our channel, I don't even know that we want anything done more. The more the United States gets its military hands and things, the more it messes them up as, as we've seen in every, every episode we've talked about, like the United States internationalism or interventionism, I should say. So I don't know that I would want it, but it's also kind of funny when they're just like, yeah, here's a document that says we agree with you. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know any thoughts there. No, that's it. Yeah. It's <laughs> ridiculous. I, I, and again, I don't know if them getting their hands in this, just like they did back in the 1950s, 56 right. with the CIA, if that's going to go well anyway, right? Like, so during this time in the in the late 80s, four massive demonstrations erupt in Lhasa, um, and they last about two years. This leads to the People's Republic of China claiming martial law in um, in Tibet, which leads to more oppression. All of the things that we've talked about, doubling down on those. There's also this idea, um, dating back to the 70s, that there is forced demographic change is getting stronger and it is becoming in response to these demonstrations to essentially drown out the Tibetan voice. By 1989, there are more Han Chinese living in Lhasa than Tibetans. That is astounding to really think about, that that many Han Chinese had been imported from China into Tibet, and they actually outnumber the Tibetans living in, in the prominent city of Lhasa. Also by 1989, the 10th Penchan Lama, again, this is second in command, had died um, and succession became a question, like who is going to see, succeed the 10th Penchan Lama? Well, the Tibetans are like, well, we, this is our, this is our belief system. This is our religion. This is our, this is our society. We choose, we choose the Penchen Lama and the People's Republic of China is like, nope, we choose for you. 
The Dalai Lama, again from Dharamshala, India, names a person named Gedan uh, Choeki, Cho, uh, again, I'm going to butcher this, Nay, Nayima, um, as the 10th Penchen Lama. The People's Republic of China names uh, Gyan Kin Norbu as the 10th Penchen Lama. Unfortunately for all of us, um, the Dalai Lama's uh, Penchen Lama is actually currently missing as we record this episode. Weird. Um, and Norbu is currently like working on PR campaigns that are very pro PRC, ironically enough, People's Republic of China, currently working to manufacture ethnic unity between Beijing and Tibet. He certainly appears to be very public like, um, anything that you would like to add to this idea of succession? Again, this, this very, I don't even know if it's a, a highly political position at this point. It's more of a symbolic position. But when you have these two sides seeking to create this this very this very important position, and this position being a public relations pivot point, why do you think the PRC was so? I mean, you know what? That that question's redundant. Like we know why the PRC is so invested in naming their guy, and we see what what's happening. I mean, do you have any commentary on it though? Nope. Okay. Um, let's keep moving forward. There is going to be, um, a Western development strategy throughout the 1980s and into the 1990s of the People's Republic of China in Tibet, Tibet being of course, far West for them. Um, essentially this strategy is going to work them through the nineties and well past the year 2000. It's during this period of time that many scholars, the ones that are, are brave enough to write about what's going on. Um, they call this the sinicization of Tibet, basically the Chinese making of Tibet to raise less eyebrows now. So essentially, rather than just calling it the genocide or the ethnic cleansing of Tibet, they use the term sinicization. Um, I, I think it still means the same thing, but perhaps it's just softer. I don't know. There are major projects that are going to be a, uh, undertaken in Tibet, such as the Qinghai Tibet Railroad. These are hot, hot projects that are going to be wildly important, but they also excuse more migration of Han Chinese workers into Tibet. Essentially, the Chinese Communist Party officials will state that Tibetans are not qualified for this type of work and don't necessarily want to train the Tibetans to engage in this type of work. Again, this is so reminiscent of what other colonial powers did um, regarding the railroads and um, building of airports in places like Kenya or South Africa or India, or of course, the United States with what it was doing with Native Americans. Um, why do you think, I mean, I guess I'm not even going to ask this question. I, it's, it's obvious. They are moving more Han Chinese to, to Tibet to, to complete these projects. And we can argue they're trying to drown out the Tibetans. We could definitely make that argument. In fact, at this point, 66% of all appointed positions in Tibet are now Han Chinese as, as of this recording. So they are becoming a minority in their own region. Um, Moreover, the thing that I always like to think about when we talk about colonial case studies and projects is did or do Tibetans actually want this brand of modernity on their terms? Colonial powers always argue that they're going to civilize, that they're going to bring these, these poor or, or bad people or whatever. Um, they, they're going to help them become more civilized or more modern, or they're going to help them in these regards because they just don't know what's best for them. But why is that always the rationale? Did, did the Tibetans need any of this crap? Did they need it for thousands of years before? Right. Did they never stop to ask, you know, the colonized if they actually want modernity? And when they do, the answer is typically unequivocally no, right? It always leads to more problems. And even like the creature comforts and all the things that we think and conveniences like highways and, and railroads and all those things, the colonized don't ever usually have that much access to those. Those are actually used for the colonizer to more efficiently extract resources and labor from the colony. Like that's why they're there. They're not there to actually help the colonize. So anyway, the rationale of the People's Republic of China, um, ironically, there's a number of data sets that they use to basically justify what they've been doing in Tibet since, since the year 2000, more or less. And here's the great irony to this. This is wonderful for me to think about. As the Chinese Communist Party is essentially using neoliberal capitalist discourses to measure their success in what they've done in, in, in Tibet. So they're using like, like things like, like I, I want to say GDPs, but GNPs, those types of things. They're using these terms. The fact that they've invested $81 million in, in Tibet since 2008, that they're building research institutions and schools, but all of those research institutions and schools favor Chinese aims, not Tibetan. They're not teaching Buddhism. They're not teaching Bon religion there. They're teaching, of course, engineering and manufacturing and all those types of things. And they're like, well, and also look at all the amazing creature comforts we've brought in the Tibetan people that they lived without for thousands of 
years. But these are the measures that you usually hear um, missionaries talk about, Western missionaries talk about when they're going to like Africa. Look at well, those shoes. We got shoes here. And, you know, all these, oh my God, there's churches everywhere now. It's amazing, right? These, we're seeing the same things from the Chinese. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right, that they're using, like, we've invested, you know, this many millions of dollars in infrastructure and et cetera. Like you said, they're using the neoliberal discourse to justify their actions, which is ironic coming from a communist nation. State. It is so right. anti-communist, yeah. it's not even funny. And of course, we would argue that the, the People's Republic of China is not remotely communist at this point in time. I don't even yeah. know what we'll call it at this point in time, but mm -hmm. it's not. Like by by communist definitions, at least what's what little is outlined in 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 Marx and Engels and and later thinkers, um, it's 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 not it's not fitting the bill. But anyway, okay. It's also during this time that they um, uh, they do unleash unleash is the proper word at this point in time unleash their war on Buddhism. Uh, when the fourteenth Dalai Lama eventually passes, he uh, everyone knows he's not passed yet, and he's a very famous world figure. Um, that the People's Republic of China claim they have the right to name the 15th Dalai Lama. That is going to create a massive, massive controversy when that happens. They also begin to outlaw religious schools in Tibet. Public schooling for all Tibetan children becomes mandatory and punishments at that school or for those schools can include torture. So if you are a Tibetan and you are not doing what the Chinese teachers want you to do, you could be tortured. Uh, they also use these things called naides, which are boarding schools. These boarding schools look just like the boarding schools in the United States where Native American children were kidnapped from their parents and their reservation and taken to these schools and had their hair cut and they weren't allowed to speak in any of their native languages and the women were given forced hysterectomies. I only want to say women. I want to say girls at this point. Little girls so they would no longer reproduce. Um, children, if they spoke out against their teacher, were put in things called the hole. They were put in holes filled with water. So, uh, yes all of those things. Those things are actually happening still with these boarding schools in Tibet. So while the United States, we could argue, has moved away from that type of policy, China has not, right? They're doing this with Tibetans. Literal kidnapping of children to indoctrinating them with Han Chinese beliefs. Essentially, again, I'm going to borrow from, from the U.S. here as, as one of the biggest perpetrators of this in history, but when they said they were like, in this case, China would be saying they're killing the Tibetan but saving the man, right? Um, monasteries are increasingly being closed throughout Tibet to this day. Those that are allowed to remain, um, are subject to modern, um, things like facial recognition software outside of the monasteries and constant monitoring. There's a very big brother presence at all the monasteries now in Tibet, which of course is as un-Buddhist as you can get, right? All the famed prayer flags that we all see in all the movies and documentaries that are all that are that are throughout Tibet, these beautiful, colorful prayer flags, these Buddhist prayer flags being hung everywhere, they're being forcefully removed by agents of the People's Liberation Army. Those are being removed now. Um, so this war on Buddhism is actually still ongoing, right? This started in the early 2000s, it's still moving forward. Um, there was briefly a moment in the 1980s where the Tibetan language itself um, engaged in a renaissance. Um, it was in vogue, though the People's Republic of China has recently started cracking down on that again. In fact, the Chinese Communist Party ordered that all po post-first grade schooling in Tibet will now be done in Mandarin, no longer Tibetan. Uh, China decides it's even going to start hitting the nomadic people of Tibet, the people that aren't even Lhasa, and maybe not, don't even have a huge political stake in what's been transpiring for the last four or five decades, these nomadic people that are just living their own lives out in the uh, Central Asian steppe, they are now being subject to PRC control. By 2015, or in 2015, China boasted that it had forcefully rehomed 1.2 million nomads from Western Tibet, removing them from their traditional way of life and animal husbandry and living, well, nomadically as, as, as hunters mostly. I want to say hunter-gatherers, but the Asian steppe doesn't have a lot of gathering, so mostly hunting, but removing them from their uncivilized lifestyle, quote-unquote. But they were improving it, even if those nomads did not realize they wanted that thing. The 2000 U, uh, 2011 UN report had revealed, though, that certain th those types of policies actually increased poverty, environment de environmental degradation, and social breakdown. Oddly enough, only two years after the program started in 2017, Qinghai nomads were actually allowed back to their pastoral lifestyle as the PRC decided that their homes that they had given them were actually needed for tourists to go out and tour Tibet. Any, any thoughts on that? 
Like it just again, it was not well thought out. Seems to be the constant policy of colonizers who really don't know what they're doing. The last real bit of Tibet being in the news, at least in terms of the West, quote unquote, was in 2008. The Tibetan unrest is what it's called. It's the last time that we paid attention. There was a series of 235 protests that broke out in Lhasa on March 10th of 2008, and these protests were led by Buddhist monks and Buddhist nuns. It was meant to commemorate the 49th anniversary of the 1959 Tibetan uprising. These demonstrations spread spontaneously throughout the Tibetan uh, plateau. It led to, of course, the arrest of monks at Labrang Monastery, which was one of the most important monasteries in, in Tibet, and increased tension and People's Liberation Army violence also increased, which led to resolutions against all monks and nuns, as well as the general citizens um, of Tibet, which basically was is giving the PLA to use whatever means necessary, it, 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 it deemed necessary to put out these uh, demonstrations. They used electric cattle prods, they used tear gas, and in some cases, live ammunition were just shooting protesters. Um, Tibetans responded by fighting the security forces and destroying all Han-owned businesses, which they wouldn't have done before because there just weren't Han-owned businesses back in 1959. Well, now clearly, as we mentioned, 66% of the population is Han. They started taking their aggression out on their Han neighbors. I can somewhat understand. I don't know if that was the best strategy, but but you understand the frustration, right? At least 200 of these demonstrators were killed by the People's Liberation Army in Tibet, although Amnesty International actually reports that 1,000 Tibetan protesters remain unaccounted for in their report on the events. Central Tibetan Administration itself reports that there were at least 5,600 arrests of Tibetans by the PLA. Protests in in support of Tibet also erupt throughout North America, Europe, Australia, India, Nepal, and even in Beijing, which was very controversial. And there were arrests in Beijing of Chinese people that were protesting in support of Tibet. There were also a whole host of of protests that have been going on and propaganda even being produced in places like Taiwan. Because again, most of our listeners know that Taiwan and China have, have, have beef. It's the Republic of China versus the PRC. So the Republic of China is naturally seeking to create allies with any other groups it identifies as oppressed by the PRC. And Tibet is one of those groups. So they are producing propaganda during this period of time as well, basically in support of Tibet, offering them refuge if they can somehow make it out of Tibet and get to Taiwan. Those types of things are taking place. The international community is so upset about what's going on in 2008 that there is a measure to boycott the uh, the Beijing Olympics at that moment in, moment in time, but that call actually falls mostly upon deaf ears as they decide there is too much money involved. So again, even in the West, even though there are a couple of um, even even individual athletes that are like like I don't support what's going on, I'm going to boycott. They are actually coerced by their national and then international Olympic committees. Like, nah, we we we've, we've got to make money. We're going to choose money over ethics at this moment in time. It, uh, why? Why? We we talked about it with the NBA at the beginning of the episode. Why? Uh, money. That's it. Right. Money over ethics. Just like everything you said. around me. That's all. Yeah. And that is, I mean, that's a, again that that. It, 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 You say you stand for these things and you want to call people out. What's going on in Hong Kong? What's going on in Tibet? What's going on in Taiwan? You want to say that, and and everyone I know, every American I ever talked to about anything international, their first go-to for the great evil of the world these days seems to always be China. Like maybe Russia again, now that it's it's reasserted itself with its invasion of Ukraine over the last year and a half or whatever, but still like it's China's always on their list, but they don't want to actually do anything about it. They want Mm -hmm. the cheap products that that are coming out of China. And of course the business leaders want to be able to sell their nonsense to China. Like, so that's way more important. It's way more important to maintain those relationships than any sort of ethical understanding of the way things are supposed to work, which of course is about as American as you can get, ironically enough. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, I want to ask you, I mean, we talked about the four reasons at the beginning of the episode. Why do you think we have stopped thinking about Tibet here in the West. I mean, basically since 2008, why have we stopped? Why has Tibet fallen off the proverbial radar um, despite these things still going on? I mean, everyone talks about Ukraine all the time. I have students going, are you going to teach me about Ukraine? I mean, it's an important thing to teach about and learn about. I don't want to dismiss what's going on in Ukraine, but like that has now taken over every other atrocity in the world. Everyone wants to talk about Ukraine. No one wants to talk about Tibet. No one wants to talk about what's going on in Mexico. No one talks, wants to talk about what's going on in sub-Saharan Africa. Like it's, it's all about Ukraine and, and, you got Ukrainian flags hanging up all over people's houses. Um, they don't want to talk about Syrian refugees. They want to talk about Ukrainian refugees. What, 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 what the hell is going on? 
I mean, part of it is that it's been going on for so long that people just have like fatigue, right? And I will warn people now that the same, if this continues, the same thing will happen with Ukraine, right? In 10 years, it will be out of the news cycle completely, even though there will still be atrocities. I mean, maybe, I hope not, but being committed there. The other thing is economic, like you mentioned, right? The more time that goes on, the more the U.S. and the China are forming, you know, amicable economic relations that benefit the governments of both countries. And so as a result, Tibet is completely left out of the discourse, right? And definitely out of the news cycle, for sure. Nobody in the news is talking about Tibet anymore. Um, The other thing is, like, I don't want to say that, like, nothing's happening there because clearly things are still happening there, but there's not a frequent amount of, you know, big events that are quote unquote newsworthy that are really like the headline attention grabbers going on just because this occupation for lack of a better word has been going on for so long. Though I will say, you know, people have been saying this forever that like when the Dalai Lama dies, that's going to be a real inflection point, but he's living forever. So I, you know, he's still alive. He's 80 something, 84, 87, something like that. So, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, there's not much to talk about, unfortunately. I mean, there's a lot to talk about. There's not much that, like, people want to talk about. So the other thing that, that, that I hint at in this last question that you probably see on your notes as well is, unlike some of the other colonial case studies that are a little bit older um, and have kind of, that have been solved in air quotes, solved mm-hmm. in a way, you know, the British in Kenya, the British no longer occupy Kenya, and now documents have been leaked Mm-hmm. Um, about what really transpired, and that why it was that's why it was such an important topic for us to cover. Um, here, the PRC and their occupation is not over, and so there's we're it's very hard to get leaked information right now. China is is has complete control over okay. the narrative right now, mm-hmm. um, and so there might be big things happening there, and we just don't know. I mean, watchdog exactly. organizations are not just wandering around Tibet free um, to be able to do whatever they want, right? Amnesty mm-hmm. the International and 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 um, uh, UNICEF and things, they're not able to just do whatever they want in Tibet, right? They're not allowed to. Um, right. So that could be part of it. We just don't have the information. Yep. Well, and I think that part of the silence is a reflection of China's success in you know, eliminating the Tibetans, both physically and culturally. And the area, like you said, is dominated by, you know, Chinese at this point. Which, again, I hate to keep making this connection, but I can't. It's where my brain goes, which is why even in the United States, you don't hear a whole lot about Native American issues anymore because the United mm-hmm. States did such a good job of, of a good job, such a morally bankrupt job of of ethnic cleansing, for lack of a better term, that that. that that it, that it does not reach the levels that it reaches of other groups or uh, sub sub groups and their mm-hmm. causes, right? Like that, right. that's, that's the sad reality of it. And, and China's done very much the same thing in Tibet. Yep. Um, so anyway, um, that's about all I have on Tibet. Um, in the comments, why don't we think about Tibet anymore? What do you think? Um, other than that, I'm going to let Nick take us out. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Thank you, thank you, thank you to our Patreon supporters. If you'd like to support us on Patreon, you can do so at patreon.com slash revolution and ideology. I am Nick. I'm Jared. Later.